Welcome. My name is Jessica Respondek. I'm here with DSG Education. Uh, tonight's presentation is on occlusal splints. It's diagnosis, fabrication, and treatment. Um, the presenter is, is Dennis Urban, CDT. He is DSG's VP of Education and Training. He has over 40 years of experience in the dental technology field, including lab management, manufacturing, technical training, sales and marketing, product development, quality assurance, writing, and lecturing. Dennis has been an eminent lecturer to dentists and technicians worldwide since 1985. He is also a formal dental laboratory owner. His lectures and training span many areas of dental technology, including digital technology, removables, implant dentures, shade communication, and occlusion. His technical articles have been published in numerous dental publications in the US, Canada, Europe, and Asia. Dennis now serves as the chair of the National Board of Certification in Dental Technology, and he is on the advisory board for IDT Magazine. And it is my pleasure to say, take it away, Dennis. All right. Well, thank you, Jessica. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. We have an international crowd and, uh, and a bunch of great attendees tonight. And we're looking forward to uh, you know, doing this presentation. And, um, and I'm always excited to do these types of presentations. And you know, I've had over 40 years experience in the dental business. I've gotten the, I had the opportunity to travel around the world. Uh, speaking with dentists and dental technicians and visiting laboratories and practices and, and sharing my knowledge and gaining knowledge uh, in the, at the same time. So uh, it's a great industry. I love what I do. And tonight's going to be an interesting uh, uh, presentation with a lot of information on, uh, on occlusal splints. So probably stuff you've heard of before and stuff you haven't heard of before. And we're going to show some actual uh, cases and actual materials that will be used in fabricating these different types of appliances. So Without further ado, let's get let's get started. We have a lot of information here. So, uh, but you know, if you think about it, you know, one of the most important joints in the in the human body is a temporal mandibular joint, and that connects the skull to the jaw. It's also one of the most problematic joints due to the TMJ disorder or TMJD. And TMJ disorder is the most problematic, uh, you know, uh, symptom in a lot of patients. You know, with pain, tenderness, swelling, and other symptoms around the face and jaw. And TMJ disorder is fairly common. And depending on the severity of the pain and discomfort that a patient is experiencing, it can also be fairly easy to, to treat and manage. So the treatment of the occlusal related disorders is often a challenge for both the dentist and the patient. And uh, these disorders are often just difficult to diagnose, you know, especially for you know, occlusal re related disorders. And uh, symptoms can be variable. You know, so occlusal splint design and function can be considered an example of the art and science of dentistry and dental technology. And once the cause of occlusal related disorders are identified, this reversible non-invasive therapy, therapy provides uh, both diagnostic information and relief without the problems that often accompany other approaches to care, that is surgery or extended drug therapy. So we're gonna talk about some of these solutions tonight. So let's get started. So some things we're gonna be speaking about is the examination and diagnosis, uh, TMJ pain, centric relation, appliance types, fabrication, digital versus traditional, methods, and we'll get to the digital aspect of it towards the end of the uh, presentation, material science, patient acceptance, and goals and predictability. And that's what we want to uh, talk about is predictability tonight with these, with these types of appliances. So what is occlusal splint therapy? Well, occlusal splint therapy may define as the, it be defined as the art and science of establishing neuromuscular harmony in the masticatory system by creating a mechanical disadvantage or parafunctional forces with these removable appliances. And a properly constructed splint facilitates a mutually protected occlusion. I'm just gonna minimize my speaker here. Okay, picture, all right. So as we go on here, let's look at these frequently asked questions. And uh, you know, some of them are, what is occlusal splint therapy? What types of splints are available? How do splints work? Which type of splint should be used and, and when? And how often should splints be adjusted? And that's a very important question, which we'll address in a little while. So, as far as the um, you know splint therapy, let's start with like splint therapy one one oh one oh one here, and uh, talk about that. You know, we'll talk about terms, mouth guards they're called, my bite guards or bite plates. There's hard splints, soft splints, combination of hard and soft splints, full mouth coverage, coverage of several teeth for TMJ disorder, or protection of natural dentition 
on newly restored restorations, especially zirconia restorations or full arch restorations and even laminates. You know, we make quite a bit of these restorations, these the types of uh, appliances in the, in the laboratory to help protect those newly restored restorations because it's a big investment for these patients. And then there's a stabilization uh, splint, uh, which prevents teeth grinding and clenching. And the splint covers, uh, covers all of the teeth and it's typically just worn at night. And then we have our repositioning splints, which is designed to correct occlusal occlusion and typically worn all day, every day. We'll continue with uh, splint therapy 101 here. We'll move some of to advanced uh, information in a little while. But um, how does uh, splint therapy uh, resolve issues? Well, splints allow the ligaments and rust muscles to relax. You know, that's, that's one key issue, the key solution right there. So, and it prevents the jaw reaction, such as grinding and, and clenching, which a lot of us do, and I still do that, you know, and then uh, it eliminates pain and discomfort, and it helps bring occlusion into a more optimal position with these types of appliances, and it offsets negative effects of bruxes. And the signs and symptoms of unhealthy occlusion, wear, fracture, and chipping of teeth, the sensitive crevices on teeth and gums, gum and bone recession, loose or shifting, shifting teeth, and worsening of periodontal disease. And that's, that you know, does damage the dental bridges and implants when they give you these, some of these symptoms. And tender muscles, headaches, and, and uh, noises when you open and close your jaw. And a lot of us have heard this, even with our own uh, TMJ, with the popping and, cl and, and clicking sounds. And we'll, we'll address that in a little while. And if you look at the occlusal forces, they can equal up to 500 pounds per square inch. That's amazing. You know, when the jaws close, your teeth should come together evenly and at the same time without any tooth or teeth touching before one another. When they don't touch evenly, this puts stress on your teeth and the supporting bone and jaw joints and, and muscles. And clenching or grinding can magnify this problem. And this is where we have some solutions with these various appliances. So let's look at some of the symptoms here. Of course, headaches, aching pain in, in around your ear, joint locking and popping, pain and tenderness in the cheek and jaw, pain and difficulty chewing, even causes dizziness and sharp facial pain and deep ear pain, facial swelling and neck and upper back muscle spasms and pain. So it's amazing how many uh, symptoms occur uh, for TMJ disorder. So what are some of the concerns? Well, a lot of us, uh, the clinicians and patients have a concern about what type of appliance you utilize, the type of design, the length of the treatment, expects results, and patient's acceptance. And the expected results should be decreased pain, increased TMG, TMJ range of motion, better occlusal efficiency. And we'll talk about those uh, appliances that help with that occlusal efficiency in a little while. And the ongoing increased improvement. And the splint design with quality material. And we're going to talk about material science and some of the materials that are out there and some of the split designs out there, including digital designs, as we move on. So the expected results, we want to be protected from TMJ and dysfunctional forces and stop the possibility of perforations or displacement. We'll talk about those perforations in a few minutes when we show some other slides. And we want to create a stable and balanced occlusion and create harmonious relationship of all muscles, discs, ligaments, and bones. So those are the expected results. And this doesn't end when the, you know, when, uh, you know, as, a, as a treatment goes on, this has to be really uh, watched and regulated as uh, uh, on an ongoing basis with the patient. So this is some information from an IDT article from Dr. Leonard Hess, uh, from this. he's a senior faculty member of the Dawson Academy. And what we wanna find out and try to find out is uh, from the patient, is their oral, medical, and dental history. Evaluation of the range of motion, very important. Centripetation load tests. And the evaluation of dentition wear. All this comes into play when you're examining the patient for an appliance. And a CBCT or MRI if necessary. And most doctors and clinicians I speak to, they are doing these CBCTs on most patients and MRIs if necessary. Let's look at the analysis of the discs and ligaments now. And you know, this is sort of a prerequisite of what kind of appliance you're going, it's going to prescribe. And the disc is the cushion that separates the, law, uh, the lower jaw from the, uh, from the skull base, as you could see here. And ligaments help to tether the disc to the mandibular condyle, as you see in the lower right-hand photo. 
And some of the analysis of these distant ligaments, there's two ligaments. The one that's closest to the skin, that's the lateral collateral ligament, and the other is located in the deep part of the joint, the medial collateral ligament. And one or both collateral ligaments may be injured in one or both joints. So we got to keep that in mind. And trauma or disease can cause any combination of collateral ligament stretching or tearing. And a result of ligament stretching or tearing is that the disc may or may not dislocate or herniate in that uh, part of the joint where the ligament has damaged. So that is one of the reasons why TMJ damage can vary from one patient to the other. So there's different levels of, uh, of damage to the patient and different symptoms. So sometimes it is hard to diagnose. And we talk about disc herniation, you know, CT or MRI is advised to diagnose disc, disc herniation. I think it's necessary upon any startup, any, any kind of treatment with temporal mandibular uh, appliances. And TMJs may be quiet or they may click or pop, like I mentioned earlier, or they may have crepitus or sandpaper sounds. In a normal TMJ, the condyle can move forward away from the ear or backward towards the ear. And if the disc is not herniated, then the joint should not make any sounds when the jaw is, jaw is opened. And if a ligament stretching allows the disc to herniate, it will slip out of place with the jaw closed. And when the jaw opens, a snap, snapping or clicking sound usually represents a reduction of the condyle beneath that disc. And upon closing, the condyle typically slips off the disc again, and the pop may be heard upon closure. So let's look at some of the appliance choices out there. And there's a lot of them, you know, and we'll talk about some of the uh, choices that DSG has to offer also. We have the Gelb appliance. I'm gonna elaborate on each one of these appliances too in the next few slides. We have the NTI appliance and the Gelb appliance probably is one of the most popular appliances when I had my laboratory. Uh, we did uh, a lot of flat plane appliances, Gelb appliances with a lingual bar and coverage on the posterior region of the mandible with some ball clasps. And that really helped the patient get in a comfort, comfortable position. And then we have the NTI class, and I'll elaborate on those in a little while also, NTI uh, types of uh, uh, splints. Flat plane was probably one of the more popular ones when I first started doing these types of splints. And then we have the relaxer splint, and we'll elaborate on that in a second. And then there's a key splint soft clear splint, which is the, uh, more of the newer type of splints on the digital side with printing, with digital printing. And then we have a splint with anterior guidance. If you can see this picture here, uh, this is actually my mouth and I actually made an appliance for myself with anterior guidance and cuspid disclusion. And that really helped me function well and become more comfortable, relax my temporal mandibular joint. And um, I wear this quite a bit, you know, so and usually at night. And uh, let's elaborate a little bit more on these appliance types. You know, we talked about before the DSG relaxer, the comfort part soft splint, bruxies, remedies, Key splints, soft clear, hard and soft uh, uh, splints, hard acrylic splints, and of course the Gelb appliance. Now the relaxer splint, uh, it's, a, it's a custom fit. It's an anti-clenching device that provides relief from migraine headaches and jaw disorders, as you can see here. And it has a little ramp on the anterior section covering the two centrals. Then we have our hard acrylic splint appliance. And this was probably one of the most popular ones in the laboratory when I first started making splints also. And they have a hard acrylic surface to protect the teeth of heavy bruxers and grinders. The problem is when we make, we make these types of appliances, you know, a, a lot of the know-how and what to do in making these appliances is, uh, is not presented. And sometimes they're not relieved correctly. And there's pain interproximally of the teeth with the teeth and the gingiva. And so we want to make sure that's, that's really relieved uh, accordingly. You still want that retention so that it stays in place. You want to relieve any of those high spots interproximally uh, when you're finishing these types of appliances. Then we have the remedies uh, appliance here. And um, as you can see, these splints relieve patients' stress and bruxism. And I'm just gonna minimize something here so I can see. There we go, that's better. Okay, so I just had, I had one box on the screen here. I couldn't see what I was uh, presenting here. So, but they also protect the, uh, the investment of cosmetic restorations. Like I spoke about before, you know, patients spend a lot of money getting these restorations, whether it be laminates, 
Uh, it could be a, even a full arch case, a screw retained uh, case, or it could be zirconia. Uh, so we want to protect those appliances because the patient's really clenching at night and when they're sleeping and even during the day, I find myself doing that's the same thing. So these appliances really help out in protecting those, uh, that, uh, that investment. And Bruxy's is made of a heat cure elasticized acrylic. And Remedies is a hybrid type of material made, made of the heat cure acrylic by Hefty Heavy Bruxer. So the Remedies is actually a little bit stronger. So it really, uh, it's really a, a good solution for those heavy Bruxers. And then we have our key splint soft material, like I, I mentioned earlier. And we'll show this material. I have a little video later on I'm going to show. But it's a 3D, 3D printable material. And it has the comfort and flexibility of a soft splint with accuracy and strength. And this is the gelb appliance I, I spoke about before, which probably many of you know. You know, it's a, it's a posterior, posterior slint covering, and it's covering the occlusal surfaces of the mandible. And it offers the patient dis, uh, less discomfort compared to the other splints. So uh, it's a lingual bar that you, you adapt to the lingual of the, uh, of, the, of the lower. And, you know, the gelb appliance for manipular orthopedic repositioning is probably one of the most popular daytime TMJ appliances in the world. And I had the pleasure to actually speak to Dr. Gelb a couple of weeks ago, and I told him about all, this, all the cases I made over the years in my laboratory. He thanked me, and he's very gracious, but he has a successful appliance here. And, you know, Dr. Gelb really came up with a good solution here. And uh, it has been shown in evidence-based research to treat temporal mandibular joint disc displacement, headaches, and sleep disorders effectively. So this is a great appliance, one of my favorites here. And this is the gelb appliance in the mouth, as you can see here. It's opened up the bite here. This is positioned on the posterior of the mandible, and we have two ball clasps. Sometimes I put four ball clasps in there if you want more retention. But I try to come up uh, over the uh, occlusal surface of the teeth, so it actually creates more retention, and it's this way it's less likely, to, you know, less likely to have to put four clasps on these types of appliances. Then we have the Comfort HS uh, splint appliance, and that's uh, the most widely prescribed appliance due to its comfort uh, uh, fit. So it's a hard, soft appliance, and it has two layers that make up the uh, splint. And each splint is made with a standard flat occlusal plane and a slight of closing uh, cuspal indentation. So we don't have that, uh, that cuspid um, uh, disc disc disclusion on these types of uh, appliances here. And uh, Jessica mentioned earlier, we're going to send that out to you as an occlusal splint chair side guide. Uh, we'll send that out to the attendees here. And, um, and you'll can see all the different types of appliances on there. So let's talk about the NTI appliance. As you can see here, this appliance here, it just covers its, its two centrals with a little ramp on it. You know, so and the NTI uh, appliance or the nociceptive trigeminal inhibition tension suppression system, man, that's a, that's a mouthful. That's a mouthful. It's a small plastic device that is originally designed to prevent headaches and migraines caused by teeth clenching and grinding. And the objective of the NTI is to relax the muscles involved in clenching and grinding. And the uh, NTI TSS device is an anterior bite stop worn over the two front teeth at night to prevent that contact from the canines and molars. So it's a very small appliance and, uh, and it works, it works. And you know, it's designed to be a deprogramming device. It shouldn't be worn and cannot be worn for more than six or eight hours a day without the risk of tooth uh, drifting or eruption. You know, and the NTI device helps the elevator muscles shut down around 70 to 80% when the posterior teeth are not touching. And this can re greatly re uh, reduce in inflammation. Then we have the dual arch splints too, so on an upper and lower arch. And this is a long-term deprogrammer uh, to be worn more than eight hours a day. And there's no contact with the posterior. So uh, we keep that space. We keep those teeth hitting, the lower teeth hitting that ramp on the upper and the dual arches. And this, this, this is a very effective deprogramming appliance. And the flat occlusal splints, this is when I first started in, in, the, in the industry, we did nothing but flat occlusal splints and, and gelb appliances. And as the years went on, we had a better understanding of occlusal splints. We started having cusp of disclusion and ramps on the anterior uh, region of the, of the splints. But these flat occlusal splints are relaxation or stabilizing splints. And they're widespread uh, in use, and they provide an even occlusal contacts. And these may be constructed for the upper or lower jaw. And on these flat plane splints, you know, the occlusal thickness of the splint has been addressed in studies, you know, and the man study showed that the splints that increased vertical dimension by four, uh, four more millimeters and 8.2 millimeters were more effective in producing muscular relaxation in patients with bruxism and myofacial pain dysfunction. 
and uh, and with patients uh, that had the uh, one millimeter splint. So the comparison of the higher uh, millimeters, the thickness, higher thickness compared to the one millimeter splints, splints they had more of a better um, solution with the uh, the vertical dimension was was opened up more from four millimeters to eight millimeters. So that's pretty interesting. You know, so. And uh, studies suggest that a minimum of a four millimeter increase in vertical dimension is necessary to protect those bruxing, uh, bruxing patients. If the patient's wearing a splint uh, four millimeters in thickness and still experiences muscular soreness, headache, or facial muscle, uh, muscle tightness immediately after waking, then that split, splint thickness should be increased incrementally, not, not all at once, but incrementally until symptoms disappear. And this is the this is the uh, appliance I have. This actually actually is my appliance. This is my mouth here, and you can see uh, how healthy those uh, uh, papillas are right there. Eh? So, but anyway, I this is a great appliance, and I, I wear this quite a bit. And I have cuspid exclusion with an anterior ramp, and very comfortable. And we'll talk about this material in a little while. But this is a great material. You 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 soften it up in warm water. It snaps into place, and it, the fit is phenomenal, and it's comfortable. You know, so, uh, so the way I fabricate these types of uh, canine guide splints for this particular material is the first thing I do is duplicate the working model. And I articulate uh, the uh, working model uh, utilizing a semi or fully adjustable articulator because I want to see those different various excursions on that articulator. And I want to have that cuspid disclusion. I want to see that cuspid disclusion in the wax. So I apply base plate wax and contour the wax to achieve that canine guidance. And this can be achieved by utilizing the articulator for lateral and protrusive excursions. And as I get those markings, I'll reduce the wax a little bit, start waxing up the splint. And then after the splint is waxed, I put sprues on there. Then I put it on, uh, and I put these sprues on the posterior region. And at this point, everything is covered with a silicone putty, including the sprues. And after the putty is set, I remove all the wax. I paint separator on the model, and I mix this Astron clear splint material, which I'll talk about a little in a little while, and I pour this into the uh, in the putty, and then I cure in the pressure pot. And I usually cure this for about 127 degrees for about 30 to 45 minutes, and very easy to finish and polish. But very uh, very effective splint. I, I'm a, you know I, I could swear by it, and uh, I, it's, it works for me. And uh, I think I'm going to try possibly that uh, uh, the uh, soft keystone splint uh, fairly soon. I know uh, Jessica has one. We're going to talk about that later, and she's very happy with it. So, uh, so the fabrication of this canine guide and splint, uh, after the material is cured, I place that model back on the articulator and I make sure that bite has not changed. I want to spot grind and work it in for canine guidance. And I finish it and polish it. And it's very simple. So, uh, and, um, and uh, this material actually now is being utilized for milling technology with, uh, with CAD CAM systems. So it makes it a little bit easier to process now. So, and there's your cusp of the exclusion, as you can see here. So a lot of good information, a lot of good uh, good uh, choices to choose from. And, you know, when you talk about adjustments, splint adjustments would be required with some weekly and some monthly, you know, but they really, the patient really has to come back on a regular basis for these adjustments. In some severe cases, or more often, as much as twice a week, you know, and it depends on how quickly you, you just moves and how if you try to, try to fully recenter in the TMJ. And, uh, you know, it's where wearing, wearing that splint is prescribed. And wearing the splint at night, and while you sleep is important, you know, in certain, certain, uh, about these types of uh, appliances with the uh, anterior guidance. And you have to settle uh, splint adjustments and a relatively stable, healthy, reproducible hinge position for the jar occurs. So it really works out well. And um, some of the underlying issues, after stabilization of the jaw is achieved, it is then time to correct the underlying occlusal issues. So this is where we have to really look at uh, different kinds of restorations, what's going to be beneficial for the patient, and we have to meet those patient expectations. And if it's not addressed, occlusal abnormalities originally present will negate any progress already made with splint therapy. So actually, you can go in reverse mode if you you know you don't address these uh, you know these after stabilization and look at those underlying occlusal issues. So we're going to talk about some different uh, types of splints here and uh, get more in depth here. And we'll start off with stabilization splints. You know, stabilization splints are effective in the management of TMJ arthralgia. And arthralgia is a term used for TMJ, TMJ pain caused by capsulitis or synovitis, which is an inflammatory condition of the articulate uh, capsule and soft tissues that surround the, the TMJ, like we saw in the earlier photos. And some of the warnings, you know, it's 
to avoid occlusal changes, all patients with any appliance must be instructed not to wear it at all times. Additionally, appliances must be regularly checked and repaired if need be. They have been cases where the splint is fractured in the area of the, of the second molars or third molars, and this is the thinnest part of the splint. And this is always something that I have a challenge with because I try to open the splint uh, as, as, as much as I can. And sometimes it's, uh, we still, if those uh, molars have super erupted, the contact is so close. And um, if that's, you know, if it's fractures in those areas and it's allowed the selective rope for eruption of these teeth, you know, that's a possibility, you know, so uh, that can cause an anterior open bite. So uh, you got to be careful about, uh, about those parts there and being thin and fracturing. And stabilization splint therapy may be beneficial for reducing pain severity at rest and on palpation and depression when compared to no treatment at all. So a major advantage and, you know, to uh, occlusal splint therapy is that the treatment is reversible and non-invasive, like I mentioned earlier. And uh, I like to stress this a few times in the presentation, the presentation, the dentist must carefully adjust the appliance at the time it is delivered and periodically that thereafter. You know, sometimes I, you know, I've been involved in, you know, with the, in the operatory with the clinician and sometimes there's minimal adjustments, you know, sometimes there's none. You know, I, I've, I've been uh, in, in the operatory where there's really no adjustments, but there's some, usually there's some minimal adjustment. You know, and an occlusal appliance, you know, as a bite guard or bite splint that we talked about earlier, you know, it's custom fabricated and it can be hard or soft. And I like the hard, soft ones also. I'm going to talk about what type of material to use for those hard, soft uh, materials and, uh, and the choices out there. We mentioned a few uh, earlier. And uh, this design must utilize anterior and condylar guidance. And that ensures the exclusion of the old posterior teeth during protrusive excursive, and any parafunctional mandibular movements, especially with complex restorative procedures, including change of occlusal vertical, occlusal vertical dimension, dimension or jaw function. So important. So, so as you know, collaborating more on these repositioning splints, you know, they're the most popular appliances for deep bite correction. You know, and they, they load the incisors for the intrusive effect, leave the posterior teeth free to erupt, and thereby leveling the, uh, leveling the curve SP primary to posterior extrusion. So these repositioning splints I see quite a bit. And studies that involve the vertical changes of molars and incisors with bite plane treatment found that the alveolar height in the molar region increased and with minimal change in the incisal area. And the intrusive effect on the incisors is at best minimal. So they consist of an acrylic platform anchored to the maxillary dentition with an arrowhead, Adams ball clasp or crit clasp. Sometimes I don't put any clasp at all, but it's nice to have those clasps on there to give it extra retention. And anteriorly, a labial, a labial bow helps to stabilize the bite plate, like you saw the one I wore earlier, the picture I showed earlier, and contact on the teeth at the incisal one third. And by acting as a premature incisal stop, usually within the confines of the intraocclusal space, and the block bursts the posterior teeth from the occlusal contact and allows them to erupt. So it's advisable not to disclude the posterior teeth more than two millimeters, though. This allows close supervision, supervision of the follow-up and treatment progress and prevents any sudden TMGA or myofunctional change. So wearing appropriate bite splints at night. You know, a nighttime splint has a number of purposes. And of course, the obvious ones is to prevent teeth wearing. You know, and I, I noticed on mine, not having a splint all these years, uh, my bite is, is closed quite a bit. bit. And I, I, I have a closed bite now. I really, you know, I really wore down a lot of my teeth. And, you know, balance support and relief, uh, relief and tension of the jaw joints is also a, a great uh, uh, result of these splints. And, and, um, and especially on the cranial bones and muscle of the head and neck. And it also, to open up the bite to create more space for your tongue at night and increases tongue volume. And uh, it's been proven to include, improve, improve energy flow throughout the body, especially helpful during sleep to improve airway and breathing and facilitate uh, refreshing night's sleep, you know, and, uh, and of course it re reduces clenching and grinding to reduce headaches, neck aches, and jaw aches. So, and I like to show this, uh, this slide here because, you know, I'm, my background is on removables also, you know, and, uh, and implant dentures and partials and full dentures. And over the years, I've gotten a lot of requests for partial or complete denture splints. And when I first started doing this, I said, man, how, how are we going to do these types of splints? How are they, splints, how are they going to stay in the mouth? You know, so, but we really could do these, especially on partial dentures. And I've done these on complete dentures also. Uh, but the denture has to, you know, you have to have a good fit 
Uh, and sometimes when we have to reline these dentures to have you know a good, good functional reline with border molding to make sure that retention is 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 evident, you know, and then we can make these bite splints uh, because you know a lot of patients take their dentures out at night, but you know if we can make a bite splint to compensate for those uh, you know for these uh, the, the clenching, uh, this is it's, it's a great solution because you know patients with dentures clench also and teeth break. You know, they're only plastic or acrylic or, or composite, so it's important. So I like to bring up that uh, this topic here. So, so let's look at the classification of bite splints. Okay, Okison classified bite splints as muscle relaxation appliances, stabilization appliances used to reduce muscle activity. And we'll compare this to the Dawson uh, technique also. And Okison also cleared anterior repositioning of appliances or orthopedic repositioning of appliances, you know, and other types are anterior, posterior bite planes, pivoting appliances, or soft resilient appliances or silicone. So those are the Okison classifications. And we look at, uh, you know, Dawson classifies bite splints as permissive splints or muscle deprogrammers. You know, and I've learned so much from uh, the Dawson Academy over the years, especially when it comes to occlusal splints and, and bite splints, you know, especially with these permissive splints and director splints, you know, and the director splints is a non-permissive splint. And then there's the third one is a pseudo permissive splint that is a soft splint or hydrostatic splint. So, and this is from an article from uh, Dr. Leonard Hess again, and he's a senior fac senior faculty at the uh, um, Dawson Academy. This is from the IDT magazine, Inside Dental Technology. And he wrote that permissive splints allow the unrestricted movement of the mandible against the appliance. And most splint therapies fall into this category. You know? And direct the splints direct the mandible into a predetermined position. These types of appliances should be used with great caution and for only a very limited period of time. And permanent occlusal changes can occur with the use of improper directive splint therapy. So you really have to know what you're doing and know the science behind what you're doing. And an example of a directive splint would be an anterior positioning device that situates the mandible into a position that is anterior to the maximum intercuspation. So if you get a chance, you can look up this article online. It's great from Dr. Leonard Hess and from IDT magazines. They have a lot of the PDFs online and a uh, great magazine and uh, great information. So. So some of the characteristics um, uh, of the occlusal splints we want to look for is stability, balance and sense regulation, equal intensity stops on all teeth, and the immediate posterior disclusion, and smooth transitions in the lateral produced with extended lateral excursions. And we want to be comfortable too, comfortable during, during wear, and reasonable aesthetics and patient compliance. So let's look, you know, we looked at the classifications before, and we looked at some of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, results of these uh, appliances when, when they're prescribed the right way. But uh, even some of the pain originating from the masticatory system structure, you know, look at the, the TMJ pain, you know, the stretching of the ret uh, retrodiscal tissues, and colla uh, collateral ligaments, capsulitis, synovitis, muscular pain, all those pains I mentioned earlier before, it can be taken, these can be taken care of with the right occlusal splint and you can relieve that pain and the patient can live, you know, normally without that pain and trying to get them into the right treatment plan. And again, we wanna relax the muscles. We wanna allow the condyle to seat in a musculoskeletal stable position and to provide that diagnostic information that we need for further treatment and to be successful. And of course, we wanna protect the teeth and the associated structures from bruxism. We wanna mitigate any periodontal ligament repro uh, proprioception and uh, also wanna have cognitive, cognitive awareness also. And we mentioned all these before, and this is some of the more ap applications of the occlusal splints and some of the therapies that are going to uh, cure those, uh, those symptoms. Okay, so let's look at material choices. Yeah. So we talked earlier uh, about the Astron Clear Splint. We're going to go through these uh, in a little while. Uh, and then this is the Urcadent material. And there's so many different materials out on the market, you know, so I, I try to squeeze as much as I can. And I try to uh, talk about the ones that I've used and been successful with in the laboratory. And we have the Comfort HS, hard heat cure clear splint, uh, clear acrylic, and so an interesting material called Versacryl. And there's a Prima Tech material, which is a light, light cure material. So, and then we have our key soft material. So let's talk about the clear splint a little bit more. This is what I made for myself, I talked about earlier. And uh, now with this clear splint material, uh, it's, you know, it's able to utilize this material with, uh, with CAD CAM technology. 
And what I liked about this is self-adjusting. You put it in hot water, it softens up on the inside a little bit, almost like a hard, soft mouth guard, and it just snaps into place and just comes back to the original shape when you put it in your mouth. And now they're gonna have this material for CAD CAM. They're gonna come in pucks or discs. Will you be able to design this on a three shape or ExoCAD system? And, uh, and it's, it's so much fun and easy to design these on these, uh, on these CAD systems out there. So uh, this is available now, I believe. You know, it's just, I think it's available all over now, even including Europe. So um, it's just a great, great um, uh, material. And now we're able to util utilize it uh, both us, uh, with, on the digital aspect also and the analog aspect of it. And there's your CAD CAM system, milling system. And then there's, there's the Ercodent system. And the Ercodent system is a, a vacuum form uh, system. And but I like about it, it has an articulator built into it. So you can have the, your, your uh, occlusal uh, information uh, in that, that splint. And you can you know, have, either have cuspal disclusion or you can utilize different materials, different thicknesses and different viscosities. And this is how it's done here. It's put, the material is put onto this, uh, this Ercodent system. It's vacuum formed. And you can finish it down very easily. It has different thicknesses. And uh, this is a pretty popular uh, appliance also. And this is an interesting material. Bursacryl, I utilize this a lot. And you'll, you'll see me, if you go into any one of my other seminars, I utilize it with the, even implant cases and, uh, and those types of appliances. Uh, but with the Bursacryl material, it actually uh, it warms up, with the, it softens up with the warmth of the mouth. And what I do, uh, when I make a hard, soft uh, mouth guard, it puts something that's for a bad bruxer, I'll make a hard acrylic uh, clear um, uh, bite splint. And then what I'll do, I'll remount the inside and I'll put this versical material. And it fits so, it's like a suction. It fits great. It sucks the, uh, into the, and goes into proximally. And the patient can wear this very comfortably. So this is versical. It comes in a clear material and a pink material. But I love this. I use it for many different applications, including soft relines. So, and there's a light cure material called Primatech. And I use this Primatech material for verification jigs on my implant cases, my hybrid cases, and those types of cases or when we're uh, having bars milled on full arch restorations. And uh, you can also use it for um, the bite splint. Uh, the thing is, it's not the clarity is not really there. The fit is good, it's quick. All you do is take this material, as you can see here on the lower, it comes in a rope form, adapt it to the ridge. You can put it on the articulator, close down the articulator, put it into a light cured unit for about four or five minutes, and then you have it, it's finished. But the thing is, it's not as clear as the other splints. So, but it's pretty strong, you know. So, and it works so for something quick, and you know, for long term. You know, I'm, I don't have any studies on long term effects, though, with this premium type, tech material, or how long it's going to live up uh, to the bad bruxism. And then there's acetyl resin, or duracetyl material, and this has been pretty popular over the years, also. And this particular case here, you can see uh, the list, this, this mouth. Uh, this this the woman here, she she's really overclosed. And if you look real closely, I don't know if you can see this here, but on number nine, there's a check mark in the number nine tooth here going across the facial of the tooth there. And this, this is, she was a bad bruxer and she's overclosed. And so what was made with, for this patient was a material uh, called duracetyl or acetyl resin. And this acetyl resin material can be milled or it can be waxed up and injected. So this is before on the left-hand side here, you can see this before and after. You can see when we opened up the patient's bite a little bit and this is before and after again. So she's more in a more comfortable position and she could take this out and clean it. She could wear it during the day and it really helped her uh, get back into the right, right position, you know, until further uh, work can be done with her, you know, and just to see appliance here. It's very simple. It goes right over her natural teeth, open up the bite. It's rigid, it's strong, comes in different shades. Uh, so all the Vita shades, and this is her before and after. So she's uh, she's more in a comfortable mode now when she uh, she's not clenching as badly and her, it eased up the pain on her TMJ also. And this comes in something, a puck form called Zerlux Acetyl LTD. And this could be milled, could be designed on CAD CAM systems and milled uh, with the uh, a milling system. So now let's talk about digital technology. I love digital technology. And you know, we've come so far with digital technology on, on removables, on dentures, on implants, on you know, you name it, it's 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 just out there. And it's just a great technology, even for bite splints. So uh, so let's look at the advantages of digital versus traditional or analog in the dental office. So now we can get digital impressions from you at the dental office. Uh, no impression material is necessary. By registration can be scanned, no gypsum is needed for poor models. It's reduced material and labor costs and it's reduced chair time. 
and it's easy CAD technology. Digital impression is emailed to us at the laboratory. We have so many different design options and multiple software choices, you know, and the file is always available if the case is lost or broken. We can always pull that file back up again or mill or print a new uh, uh, vice splint, which is great. And there's a lot of various print, and material, print material choices and mill material choices for soft splints and hard splints. So we talk about a dental laboratory aspect of it, you know, you know, it takes us a lot of time when we do it the traditional analog way, you know, so uh, now we have no models to pour. We have a virtual articulation uh, on the screen and it's a quick design of the splint. It's great. You can have cuspal disclusion, you can have ramps, you can, you know, make it thick or thin and printing time is much less than acrylic curing time, you know, so, uh, and we have printable and mill materials for soft and hard splints. Again, no chips and no wax, no duplicating material, no acrylic. It's great, you know, and consistency with accuracy and design. What you see on that screen when you're designing these, these cases is what you're going to get on a, on a final milled or printed um, uh, appliance. So scan is accurate, the fit is precise, and the file is stored and available for duplication in the, the appliance. And it can be designed with cusplet uh, disclusion or anterior ramps. Let's look at the, the time comparison. This is pretty, pretty uh, neat here. When you look at the traditional versus the digital here, you know, and uh, you can see how much time it took. So to pour a model and duplicate it, you know, to wait for everything to set, you know, and pouring a model takes a few, you know, few minutes, but by the time you wait for it to duplicate, uh, to set and after you duplicate it, it's about an hour and 45 minutes. And then, you know, you look at the other aspects of it, you know, when we're talking about waxing, flasking, packing, curing, finishing, polishing, it's about three hours and 30 minutes. It's about a total of about five hours and 15 minutes. We don't realize it's that much time because most of the time we're doing a few of these at a time. You know, so, uh, but it's a lot of time, you know, it's in a lot of time consumption in the laboratory. And, you know, when we go over the digital side, you know, the comparison, it's a lot less, you know, so we're going to be designing, nesting and printing, and that takes about 55 minutes. So after it's printed and we wash off the, uh, the supports, we have to clean in and post cure it. So that's another 25 minutes. So it's a total of 80 minutes curing time, you know, or processing time. Uh, compared to five hours and 15 minutes. So it's a lot less time. And I know this doesn't mean a lot to people in the dental office, unless you have a laboratory in the office, which could, could mean a lot. But to, to us at the laboratory, you know, it's so efficient to do things digitally now, you know? So then we have our virtual articulator. You know, we can design these on a virtual articulator. This happens to be with three shape. And uh, it goes into all different excursions. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's great. We even have a virtual face bow, you know, that we can, you can utilize. So it uh, goes into different excursions. You can have your anterior ramp, Cusp of the exclusion. And again, this is with three, three shape here. This is a great, uh, great uh, CAD system that they have. And just a bunch of systems out there you can choose from, you know, so, um, and then uh, also, you know, to some dis design options, this is ExaCAD. You know, there's so many design options for thicknesses and ramps and, and uh, which teeth to cover and, and things like that. And so it's everything, it's, it's real simple. So the software is so user-friendly, really is. And again, they have a virtual articulator also with the uh, Exacad system also. So great system, great and great materials you can utilize with it. And, uh, you know, talking about printing, these are just a couple of printers that are out there. One of the more popular ones is a carbon printer that we utilize uh, and, uh, and among other printers that we have in the laboratory. Uh, but the carbon seems to be one of the uh, uh, one of the ones that really works, one of the best that we have. So, so we have some of the, to talk about digital appliances. One of them is the Panthera Sleep Night Guard, and this is a, an option, you know, and this is a printed material, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's touted for great comfort and more robust protection, and it's one of the smallest full arch night guards on the market, you know, and, and if you, you're familiar with the Panther uh, Sleep Appliances, you know, uh, this is comprised of a nylon material, and it's the same 3D printed material that's used in their uh, Panthera DSAD Sleep Apnea or Normal Appliances. And uh, only without the uh, you know the, the other parts that come along with it, you know, to bring that uh, that lower jaw forward. But it's a metal grade material, and it's durable and rigid. And the occlusal surfaces are, are, are comfortable. Uh, it's comfortable. It's rigid on the occlusal surfaces, and um, great retention. So this is one of the options that it has out there. And then we have our uh, printed material, you know, the key splint material. And this is our key splint hard. And I like the soft material. I'm going to show you in a minute. But you can do the regular key splint material. You can design on the on uh, many and many of these different different systems with Exacad or uh, or, um, or the other ones I showed earlier, three shape. And this is the material; it's biocompatible, transparent, polishable, stain resistant, 
and it's fully compatible and it's in compliance with the you know, medical device regulations and standards. So it's a great material and uh, we've been very successful with this. And, and Jessica, the one who introduced me before, Jessica, uh, she, she really loves her appliances, uh, appliance here. She's had it for a while. So uh, she can elaborate on that when we, when we go to questions and answers. So we really, really simple design. You can do a thin one, a flat plane, a ramp, you know, it can do anything you want. So I just wanted to show, this is how it comes and when it looks when it comes out of the printer. And we remove those uh, supports and we have to post cure it. Again, here it is after, after it's out of the printer. So we look really nice material and easy to finish and polish. I just take a carbide bar, just take off the smooth down where those supports were and polish it. And there you have it, this beautiful appliance. Very nice. So, uh, and I'll show you a little, little short video on this in a second here. And this is in the printer also, just so it looks in the printer. So you can do about quite a number of these at one time also, which is nice. You can have all these different designs in, in one aspect and have everything done uh, in, 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 in the period of time is so much less than the traditional analog way. And then the procuring unit, you know, just you know, it's about thirty minutes total after you after you uh, post cure it, um, and you need to post cure these though. You know, you can't just take it out of the printer and uh, and put it in the mouth. You know, so you have to post cure it. And there's another system out there. So you know, there's a lot of systems to choose from also with these post curing units. And we'll show a little video here. You can see this here. Let's just see how pliable it is and how uh, how strong it is. And this is just a simple flat plane uh, appliance here. And that's pretty cool. I like that appliance. And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to try that one next. I know Jessica's pretty happy with her. So, and a lot of patients are, you know, we've been making quite a bit of these in the laboratory now. <clears throat> and there you go. Nice. So, well, that's the presentation. You know, I just want to make sure I want to, I want to just get across that, you know, while occlusal splints are effective for managing things, things like teeth grinding and bite occlusions, it's often that they, you know, to note that they aren't necessarily a permanent fix for them. You know, that's where dentists may recommend additional treatments, which include the likes of orthodontics, specialized dental work to adjust occlusion, or even surgery to ensure that the individual individuals don't fall back into bad habits. For example, if those wearing a repositioning splint, the bite may have changed as a result. However, failure to wear the splint will cause the bite to fall back into the same uneven alignment. And the type of splint utilized is dependent upon the diagnosis. You know, a careful medical dental history along with a comprehensive examination is necessary for all patients, but especially those with facial pain, TMD, or proxism. And for TMD patients, the selection of a splint is dependent on the diagnosis of the disorder. And for the specific diagnosis of temporal mandibular disorder, the familiarity with applications of splint therapy for patients who are with occlusal related disorders can be one approach to a treatment to affected individuals. And proper diagnosis and fabrication of the appropriate device can often result in the relief of these symptoms. You know, so this, it, these, these, symptoms, these uh, appliances work if they're done correctly and utilize the right appliance. appliance. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us tonight. I hope you had a positive learning experience today, you know, and may you apply your knowledge and expertise in a positive way, in a way that will enhance, enhance your careers and self-worth. But thank you for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it and have a great night. Stay safe. Take care now.